having your back against the wall, you're struggling, you know, um, in practice, you're struggling and you need a tool because maybe they have game point and you have to fight it off. What's a good emotional management tool for that moment? Uh, let's see if you're, cause the emotions could be, it, it could be, you know, the player, it could, their mind could be going all over the place. You know, and they really got to stop and lock it in. Most of the time, what I, how I coach it is I say, essentially, you know, play like a, I don't know if you remember Jimmy Nichols at all. Do you of course. All? Yeah, of course. Stall. Like, just stall. Like, go, if you need that extra moment, a ref is going to recognize that. They're not an idiot. Uh, right. And they're going to be like, okay, you know, you, this is a big point, And you go and you shake the line or you go clean your glasses off or, you, you know, for girls, you know, redo their hair kind of a thing or their whatnot. Um, and, and during that moment, what's going on in the mind? Is it just, is it just slowing down or is it like yeah. preparing? It's, it's slowing, it's slowing everything down and going, okay, you rack it, you recognize the gravity of the moment. Your mind is racing. Um, you really want to side out obviously to, to, you know, to tie it up at 20 all or something like that. And you're, you're, you're thinking about 50 things instead of just, okay, I got to get to my, you know, do the best job I can here and focus on pass first. Okay. So I go shake the line. I take some deep breaths, come back, settle in, focus into the serve whistles blown. I'm back into where I need to be. Um, where versus, and I've done this, you've probably done this. Everyone's probably done this at some point in time. And I have a lot of gals that do this and I, I don't want to say I yell at them, but I take them to task a little bit, which is as soon as the play's over, they're like, I, they're practically sprinting back to their spot. And you're like, why are you, is there a need to sprint back? The score's 2019. Like, or even worse, you've given up three points. You're now speeding it up. And I tell them all the time, when you're play, when you're scoring the points, speed it up, run back to the service line. Momentum. Get it going. Like, yeah. yeah. Boom, 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 boom. Get it going. If you're losing those points, then it's all about slowing things down, try and get the momentum away from them, whatever it is that's going on in your head or your partner's head. Um, that that's such a to, to me that's key in volleyball because there are the stoppages and you know soccer would be totally different uh, where the, the the play is just constantly going. You can't take ten second break otherwise you you just screwed your team or could have screwed your team. So. That piece in, in volleyball and beach volleyball, I think, is, is tough for some people to get their heads around. Um, but understanding that there is momentum, but it can be shifted real easily by stalling or speeding up and um, allowing your brain to slow the game down and slow your thoughts in your head to be more focused on what you need to accomplish in that infinitesimal moment rather than big picture. Uh, and that's another one too, where you know, focus on the small, not the big. As soon as you focus right. on the big picture, you're usually going to lose or you're going to give up a point. And that helps you stay in the moment more too. I believe, yes, absolutely. And this is coming to my mind right now. I don't have this written down, but uh, I'm curious how you did this as a player and now as a coach. Um, how do you use the stoppage time? There's about 10 seconds between every play. So I'm assuming that you use it to uh, visualize the next play. But do you do any reflection on what just happened? Yeah, we actually we have a sports psychologist and he talks about it. Um, and it's kind of a, a psychological flow um, of, you know, you're, you're prepped for the point. Um, the, and there's kind of like four points. And it's, it's a circle, but there's four points to the circle. You're prepped for the point. The play happens. That's kind of the first. Uh, play ends. You quickly kind of review it in your brain to the next point. Um, look at what you need. You know, did you do everything right? Did you do it wrong? Do you need to change something? Whatever that is. Um, and then kind of flush it. Okay, um, I know what I need to accomplish here. Time for the next point. We're back to point, you know, at, to 12 o'clock. And then we do it again. 3, 6, 9, 12. 3, 6, 9, 12. Um, and to me, that's what every time I was a player, I just, I reflected on that last, last play for that, you know, three to seven seconds of what happened. Is there something I need to review and change 
Uh, is there something that uh, I that went perfectly? Did they do something that was just great? Uh, and that's kind of that's that instantaneous three second, five second, seven second. Figure out what happened. Figure if there needs to be a change, and then either enact the change or keep doing what you're doing if it's working. Don't don't change anything. Kind of kind of thought process. Cool. Uh, so yes, that three to seven second. Meanwhile, you're you know walking around and um, clearing the court. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I I feel like a lot of kids uh, don't quite know how to utilize that time because if you if you add up all that stoppage time in a match, that's a long time, oh, yeah. you know. And so I think it's really important to utilize that time. Um, with a little reflection, like you're saying, but a lot of visualization about what's coming next. And I like how you, I, you were one of maybe the best passer in the world um, uh, for, you know, for that time that you were playing. And, and I love how you said one pass, you know, like those, those little keywords that come into our mind, like really make a difference of how we're going to execute what we want to get done, you know? And, and so those can, are there any other keywords that come to mind? Um, quick ones like that, one pass, like move your feet, one your feet. pass. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. For me, you know, get get your point preparation. Um, take a look. Um, like when I'm attacking, taking my look. Um, Uh, let's see here as, as a, these, are, these are like little things that as I'm playing or even as I'm coaching, I guess. Right. I right. Say to someone like, you know, Hey, take a look, which is, it should be an immediate. Okay. Or move your feet, um, lift, um, lift with your legs. Um, don't swing your arms. That's more of a negative one, but if someone's you know, jang or something like that, uh, so we've come up with a lot of those little, I think they're kind of mostly universal for the most yeah. part. Yeah. Yeah. But does anything change with that if you're winning or losing or does it all just stay the same? You know, you know for me, uh, it all pretty much stayed the same as a player. Uh, right. And I, I'd side out. Yeah, God, I got I to gotta lift that pass a little higher. Phil barely got his small adjustments. Way. Right. Yeah. And so I'll even do that when, um, you know, when we side out of, okay, I got to remember that. And then, the next go around when we're actually siding out, I'll try and, you know, remember that piece. Uh, and I think cool. to, everyone's brain works differently that way. Um, and, and can you, for some people, it'd be really difficult to go along two threads. I side out, but I'm telling myself, Hey, remember you got to lift this ball. Well, but that's not going to happen in the next play because we're serving in the next play. So now I'm thinking about strategies of how to score points, but then I can have my brain go back to, you know, say we score two points, I can go back to three points earlier where I told myself, okay, lift that ball. I can do that. I don't know that everyone can. I'm sure that there are lots of people that can, but I'm sure there's lots of people that are like, whoa, I, my brain will explode if I try and like remember all those different pieces. Right. That also may be me talking at you know 46 uh, and remembering what I did in my 30s versus say what I did when I was 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. So, um, I mean, ultimately, it's uh, to me, it's it's trying to focus on the one good thing that you can focus on, and then flushing. That, to me, that's probably the biggest thing. Is these kids don't flush, man. They that's just, right. They, they just they they rem- they hold on to everything like it's the biggest deal on the planet. And you're like, dude, the score's three two. You held on to this point. Now we're down eight two because you could you couldn't let go of that one point. That's right. Right. That's exactly now, now right. You're, now you're screwed. <laughs> Now you're actually battling, you know, to try and climb back up. And, uh, you know, I, I had one team that was constantly doing that uh, at Poly, And it was frustrating because they'd always fall behind. I mean, unless they were way better than the team, which did happen a lot. But when it was a, you know, pretty evenly matched battle, they would always be a little bit behind. And a lot of times they would come back and win the, the game, but they'd always be here. They they'd kind of, they'd never uh, just – you know, take it here and then be here and then just keep going here because they would remember what something would happen and they would be focused on that for two, three, it would affect them for two, three points. And so they'd always keep, keep falling behind instead of going ahead. Flushing. I love that flush, whatever just happened. And, and to me, that means take a deep breath and come back to the technical stuff. 
right? I mean, is that is that what kind of you did? Yep. And uh, one of the things that uh, I, I basically started using that kind of when Karch, uh, I, I don't remember exactly, maybe I was 22 or something like that. I think it was my rookie year on tour. Uh, and we were at dinner and I asked him, hey, if you're going to give, you know, one piece of advice, what would you give someone advice? And it might have even been in high school. I, I don't even remember. But mm -hmm. he said, I, for, I always forget the last play. I was like, okay, yeah. I mean, I, and, and the reality is you're not necessarily – I realized later on he's not forgetting last play because if he just scored, he's thinking about, okay, how did we score? How can I score again? But his point was every play is different. Mm. Uh, you're not reenacting the same play. So the, the last play – oftentimes has no bearing whatsoever on this next play. Mm. Your last pass has no bearing on the, the, the pass coming up here. Now you can make adjustments. Someone's serving you line and you're way in the middle of the court will make an adjustment. Uh, but that, that piece of advice kind of really struck me and uh, flushing and those kinds of terms are the same type of thought process. I love that. Well, since you mentioned Karch, let's move on to this question. Where do you get inspiration from? Um, I mean, from a, a one faith, two family, um, three um, guy. You know, if you want to go into like more volleyball, um, you know, guys like Karch, who was a Santa Barbara local, um, that you know when I was growing up was pretty much at his peak uh, okay. and dominating everything. Um, and obviously, being in Santa Barbara, you heard tons about him. So always, you know put him on something of a pedestal and then, uh, you know, got to know him a lot more and uh, no longer put him on a pedestal other than just the pedestal of recognizing his amazing accomplishments, uh, which I think everyone does. Um, so getting inspiration from, you know, someone like that. And, and that can be in multiple sports too. For me, Magic Johnson, I really enjoyed playing, watching Magic Johnson. He was just such a team oriented guy. It was all about, getting someone else to score and getting the assist not Magic. scoring himself and uh it might be one of the reasons why i gravitated towards being a setter as well as you know, in setting you're not getting the glory um you're trying to set someone else up to get the glory and i actually really enjoyed that aspect of of volleyball indoor volleyball of like literally just juking out the blockers and let and, you know the guy comes up and just Yahtzee's an X or, you know, with no one up and everyone goes, you know, schnitzels and, and you know, like, okay, yeah, that was, I set that up and I'm so stoked for him that he was able to do what he did. That's awesome. I love that. Um, Todd, how do you define success and what does being successful mean to you? Uh, I mean, to me, I guess for always, and we kind of touched on this already, being successful, and, and I remember telling my parents this when I told them I was going to be uh, a pro beach volleyball player uh, right after college, or I wanted to be. Um, and I, they said, okay, well, what does that mean? And I said, well, I'm going to give myself three years to be successful. And to me, being successful was, uh, as far as being a pro beach volleyball player, was being able to earn enough money to take care of I wasn't married at the time, but uh, was about was going to get married a year later. And if I had kids, which I didn't have for another couple of years, but being able to support them um, through beach volleyball. Um, as I've aged, I realized that the success part is looking back and recognizing, and people talk about this all the time, the process to get you there. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I remember people ask me a lot about the the – um, the gold medal and you know oh is that just the greatest sense like you know yes but it's really the three years leading up to that when I first you know started playing with Phil and we did so many track workouts and plyometric workouts and practices and traveling in a car and just like all that stuff I look back at that with a lot more fondness um, and memories uh, and enjoying that process and saw it, seeing how that was a build from point A to point Z uh, and ultimately point Z being, you know, Beijing. But like, to me, that was the, more, the, the part where I look back and go, that's what created the success. Uh, and I kind of have a, I, I do my goals in a pyramid structure, uh, just like you um, are doing as well. And mm -hmm. the, 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 
the top of the top of the pyramid obviously was a gold medal. Um, but there were so many things underneath it that helped build. I'm really big on having a lot of variations in there where there your, your, you know, your floor of the pyramid goals are something that you a hundred percent, not a hundred percent, 90% know you're going to get because that builds uh, success that builds that positive endorphins and, and, and lets you try and take the next step to the next level and the next level and so on and so forth. Um, and when I talk about goal setting with our team, you know, we talk about, Hey, what, what do we know? What, what do we know we can accomplish here? Look around you. What do we know we can accomplish? Okay. What's the next step? What it's going to be, we think we can accomplish. It's going to be hard and we're going to have to work hard to do so, but you know, we're, we're 50, 50 on whether we can accomplish this 75, 20 and the next level is okay. These are going to be really hard. And can they, can we accomplish them? Absolutely. And then, you know, my pie in the sky, which is what I call it top of the pyramid. It would be, you know, win an NCAA championship or something like that. That's just really, really hard to do. Um, and no matter what the team it's, that's still the end goal, but it's not the only goal. Uh, and that doesn't define whether we're successful or not. So many other things within the pyramid below and the goal, the smaller goals, maybe we set, define whether or not we were successful so you're always if you, if you i always felt like if you do goals that way you're always successful you always can look back and go yeah my first level of goals i accomplished 90 percent of them my second level 60 percent my third level 30 percent and you just you were successful all the way there maybe you didn't get to win the gold medal but you were successful in so many other areas um and that's obviously just within a sport. Uh, there's so many sure. other ways to, to view that. Um, so that's kind of, I guess that's kind of how I define success is not necessarily the end, the end goal. It's um, the process to try to do your best to try and get to that end goal. That's awesome, Todd. Um, building on that, how do you consider the idea of failure? I consider the idea of failure the most optimal time to learn, hands down. Um, if you are always successful, you probably, and I, and I, I push this pretty hard when I'm coaching. Um, mm -hmm. and I realized it very early on in life that, um, when I was successful, I didn't learn very much. Um, not that I didn't learn, but you know, you learn certain things, sure. uh, you learn how to carry yourself when you're successful and not be, you know, an arrogant, arrogant jerk or whatnot. Um, that was always important to me to, you know, acknowledge, whoever I had just beaten, I acknowledge my partner, my teammates or the people that were involved. Um, but man, when you fail, you, you, you sit there and you, you go over every little thing. At least I did. Um, and I've found that most of the, the team teams, players, et cetera, that I've been involved with um, are much more focused and ultimately more successful when they have some failures or even some key failures uh, that drive them uh, to be, you know, to, to whatever their ultimate goal is. So what do you mean by key failures? Uh, you know, it's that team that is just, uh, you've probably been, you know, you were at UCLA, you were on some really good teams where you guys are just in cruise control and you're just smashing everyone and you're just kind of rolling uh, and it's getting too easy and practices are a little bit eh, maybe distracted and they're, because, you know, I mean, no, you know no change is going to happen. You guys are just you're cruising. And then all of a sudden, you know, someone punches you in the mouth and you lose. Uh, and I look at those as like those are those key failures where we went, whoa, we're not unstoppable. We can be beaten. Crap. And it's kind of it's the wake-up calls um, that can drive you so much farther. And it, obviously, a, a, an undefeated season's pretty amazing when, in any sport. Um, but to me, those key failures, when you have a really good team, almost no team just goes undefeated. It's just so unheard of. They usually, you look back at a team that's, let's say it's a volleyball team that's 35 and three. Well, those three losses are usually, when you look at them, they're like, wow, those, those were key losses that really pushed you to the next level. Uh, and then you plateaued and then you lost again. I mean, most of the time, that's how it works. Uh, not thinking about injuries and whatnot, uh, but even injuries. You get someone key injury happens to the, your stud outside hitter, you lose. It's like, whoa, we're really dependent. We got to make sure that guy's healthy and taking care of himself. So 
to me, failure mm. is just the greatest opportunity to learn. I love that. I love that. And I agree with you. Awesome. Um, I have a few more questions, but these are a little bit shorter. If we could, we, if we could popcorn these ones, that'd be cool. Um, what are the most successful habits that you do on a consistent basis? Uh, set myself daily, daily goals in a little, literally in a sticky note. Um, and, That's cool. and then cross out stuff as I slowly but surely accomplish it. Doesn't mean I accomplish every one of them, but uh, I do that every morning, uh, sometimes the cool. night before. Uh, so I get up at, you know, 6 a.m., 6.30, whenever the sun wakes me up and um, start crossing out those goals. Love that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that too. Uh, what's the most important lesson that helped shape who you are today? Um, from an athletic perspective, um, we, uh, when I was a soft, sophomore in high school, uh, my coach, we were in a double overtime, uh, sorry, sudden death, double overtime, something like that. We've been playing soccer for forever. Uh, there was about, I want to say like 10 minutes left in the overtime. And my coach told me to take a penalty kick. And I was only a sophomore. I was the youngest guy on the team. Uh, and uh, a senior ran up to me and said, are you sure you're going to make it? Are you sure you're going to make it? And I was like, no. <laughs> and, uh, well, if you're not sure, you shouldn't be taking it. I'm like, well, I'm not sure. Like, you're never sure if you're going to make it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put forth the best I can to, to do it. And he basically is like, well, you shouldn't take it. And so then this other guy ended up taking it. He missed. Uh, and then about seven minutes later, I'm not kidding you, there was maybe two, three, four minutes left in the game. My coach puts me back to sweeper. I was, had, I'm usually a mid, center mid. Puts me back to sweeper for defensive purposes because I'm a pretty good sweeper. And I don't know why, but for whatever reason, uh, I goalie kick. I try and kick the ball off my foot instead of heading it completely with it dude goes and scores the winning goal with like two minutes left uh and i was obviously just totally distraught um 15 years old and uh, the whole you know in my opinion the whole reason we lost was because of me um other people you know most of them did not most of the team did not see it that way but i did and what i learned was you know what <laughs> when you get the chance take it i.e. it should have been I should have been the one to take that penalty shot I may not have made it um but man hey you know what get out of my way I'm taking this penalty shot and owning it's like taking the last shot own it be you know and it kind of like to me the mentality was uh you, you got to risk being the zero to be the hero mm. uh, and uh and I've always kind of lived with that like I'm not just going to not go for it um and then and play safe and I coach that way. Like, don't play safe. Be aggressive. Um, that doesn't obviously mean just go out and blast it. Sure. Uh, but be aggressive in your mindset. That's, uh, that's awesome. Um, can you share the biggest challenge you've been through on your journey? Um, I mean, honestly, probably just, you know, trying to uh, – to, to balance um, – family with uh the amount of travel that i was as a pro athlete I mean, sure you, know, you dedicate to training and being gone and um you know for all essential purposes my wife was a single mom for great swaths of the summer <laughs> wow. uh, and um you know, trying to do my very very best to balance that piece um was that was hard. It was really hard. And, uh, constantly ha trying to have to figure out, okay, this is how I earn my bread, um, and support the family. But at the same time, you're, you're missing out from a lot of stuff with kids and, and whatnot. And that was uh, really, that was very difficult. How important is the idea of having impact to you? Um, I, I honestly, it's, I don't know that it's, it's not really that, uh, it's not super important, um, to me. Okay. It's, um, it's more a matter of giving someone the tools 
uh, as a coach or doing the best that I can. And if that ends up being impactful, awesome. Um, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to worry about being impactful for my, my, the people that I'm coaching or when I was playing that will happen on its own. And it's just not, to me, it's not wor worth worrying about it or even focusing on it. Just essentially do what you do and you'll end up ultimately being impactful if you do it the right way and you do it with uh, full energy moving towards something that you're trying to accomplish. I love that. Um, I, I skipped over one going back to challenges. What's the biggest challenge you see for your athletes? In today's day and age, uh, hands down, just the, the, the distractions that they have. Um, and everyone already talks about this and I, I kind of didn't, as a player, I didn't really see it as much. Uh, and it was actually happening at that point in time as a player, I think, especially in my thirties. Uh, but having kids and then working with college kids is, I mean, they have so many things constantly distracting them simply because right. they, you know, they've got phones and computers and everything is just you know, now, 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 now world and uh, slowing them down and, and be really trying to get them to be thoughtful and big picture thinkers um, rather than being um, completely uh, scatterbrained, just, you know, millions of things and focus on the, the single thing you're trying to accomplish right now um, without all these other things going on. And what is that ultimate goal that we're trying to achieve and what is what you're doing helping you do that? Or are you thinking about your boyfriend and you know, the text you got to send out and this, sure. and that and, um, that's, uh, that's, <laughs> That's always been the case, I think, with everyone, but it's even magnified much more so now. Yeah, it's the device generation, the personal device, you know, and the, or I call it the Instagram generation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just got a few more here. This is awesome. Um, what brings you joy? What part of your work brings you the most joy? Uh, seeing them, seeing my players succeed. Um, I mean, that's just hands down. It's not even not even close. Um, seeing them put all the work in, do the things that they, they were supposed to be doing and then see them implement that within a game and, and have the success. And even if they don't have the success, um, seeing them implement that, whatever that is, um, and going, Hey, did you see how that, how you were better because you did this? Um, yeah, that's just, I mean, it's, so there's a lot of joy in that and yeah. uh, that's why people teach it's why people coach etc is you can impart something and then you see it and you see the light bulb and then when the light bulb goes off for someone that's just it's a cool feeling when you know ah i helped them get there and and that's i mean that's the impactful uh, and it does feel good uh, but not why necessarily that's all, it's all about but um definitely brings you joy or me joy yeah uh, likewise, me and you both, man. Um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received and why? I think you, you mentioned that with the zero, you know, being. Karch. Yeah, Karch. Yeah. Um, what is your ultimate why, Todd? My ultimate why? Um, I mean, that's getting pretty, uh, pretty out there. Um, let's see here. I don't know that I've really pondered that that thought a whole hell of a lot. Um, I mean, there are times where I pondered, you know, why can't we all just you know, get along type of stuff, like kind of more worldly thoughts. But I also recognize um, why um, we, we don't. Uh, that was actually one of the cool things about the Olympics is when you are in the, uh, or at least for me, when I walked into the opening ceremonies uh, in the bird's nest in Beijing, was seeing so many countries there whose athletes um, were uh, there to compete against one another, but their politicians were at war uh, and still being able to kind of, you know, hug and congratulate and, you know, really kind of a, a focus on a competitive spirit in sport, which is the Olympic spirit uh, and getting past all the other stuff um, that is going on within their countries 
whatever those were, um, that was pretty, it was actually very impactful for me. Went, wow, this is what they talk about when they say the Olympic spirit. I know, I get it now. Um, and, and it was, it was pretty neat actually. Wow. One of the best answers I've ever heard to that. That's beautiful. Um, looking back on your journey, is there anything you wish you could change and why? Um, I mean, lots of things I wish I could change. Um, but most of them are pretty small. Um, okay. I mean, the, the reality is, is to me, you're kind of, you're more the, you're the, you're the sum of your parts. And if you change lots of things, then so, and if you change any big things, you're not going to be who you are. Uh, and I guess if you don't like who you are, then yeah, you might want to go back and change some things. Um, I, I like who I am. Um, I think I'm a, I'm a good person who, this is my own viewpoint of myself, but I think I'm a good person who's trying to do the best they can and, uh, help, uh, others out, whether that's within coaching or, you know, family or friends or whatever that is. Um, so I, I can't, honestly, I can't say that there's, there's anything massive that I would go back and, and, and change. Um, because I don't know, I don't, I don't, I like where I'm at right now. And, um, cool. I don't know how that would change that. And so yeah. it would be, yes, there's some you know terrible things that have happened that I'd, I'd love to change, and, but would I be the same person now? Cool. That's great. So my next question is about the pyramids, but rather than talk about these pyramids, I actually am curious about your foundation to your pyramid. And you, cause you said you have your own pyramid and right. It's a, it's more of a goals pyramid. Yeah. Goals pyramid. That's cool. So can you just give me an idea of what you have on your foundation? You don't, it could just be off the, off the top of your head, but like, well, like for yeah. example, as a player, um, you, I used to do, uh, like uh, simple things um, uh, like uh, for ABP, for example, uh, the bottom of the pyramid would just be, I, I want to, as let's see in, in 2006, like Phil and I were pretty good, obviously uh, we were just gotten together, but uh, and I, I was like, okay, I want to get uh, a ninth or better um, to start the season off. Um, uh, or at some point in time, get a ninth or better. Then I want to attain a fifth, and then I want to attain this. And uh, and then as I went up through the pyramid, it would be uh, I want to make um, eight out of 12 semifinals. Um, then as you move up another step, I want to make uh, six finals. Uh, I well, want very to, specific. Well, very specific, yes. Yeah. They weren't just like um, – I mean, there were a lot of them. I had tons of them. I had okay. literally, literally lists. So it was, it was, I, I viewed it in my own brain as in a pyramid, but it was literally like tier one, tier two, tier three, moving up, 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 up. Um, and they were just your know, tier one goals. There was a lot of them. Uh, and the, cool. the top of the pyramid obviously was just uh, whatever for 2008, obviously would have been Olympic gold. Uh, tier two would have been make the Olympics or make a medal at the Olympics, make the Olympics kind of stuff. Um, cool. So I, I've just found that's the same reason I do daily stuff. You know, if I have seven, eight things I want to do today, I've got them all written down. Um, and then when I'm done, I, I cross them out and sometimes they go to the next day just cause sometimes I, uh, it's just takes too long. Uh, you know, the, whatever that is, whether it's mowing the lawn and I thought it would take me five minutes and it took me 20 minutes for whatever reason, you, know, you only have a certain amount of time in the day. Sure. So trying to get those things done, but I've always found that that really gives me a sense of accomplishment. Cool. So I was inspired to make my own pyramid um, based on John Wooden's and based on my idea of my top of my pyramid would, and I suggest that to other athletes and other people. I, I think everyone should make their own pyramid of what they're trying to achieve. Would you suggest that as well? Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, I do it with goals, um, but I do think you can do it with lots and lots of things. What kind of person yeah. do you want to be? Right. Um, you know, and how are you going to get that to be that person? That's great. Okay, last question. All right. Having achieved the peak of athletic achievement, winning the gold medal, what does fulfillment mean to you? And talk to me about winning gold. Um, fulfillment nowadays for me is um, 
helping probably more than anything else, helping others. Uh, mm. but, and I think that's why I've always, I've kind of always gravitated towards that anyways. I've always enjoyed coaching and teaching others, uh, but helping others accomplish what they want to accomplish, accomplish their own goals. Um, it's obviously what you're doing as well as, as a coach and a club director um, is, is really trying to help club gals reach whatever goals they, you know, maybe that's college, maybe that's, pro maybe it's olympics maybe it's just making your high school team um you know i mean that's that, that is the reality of some you know the, the pinnacle of some gals goals in the sport um and, and it might be the reality too uh, and that's kind of where I, I try and as a coach a lot of times uh come in and, and try and be a little bit of a reality check on that as well you know if i get a uh, and and i remember carrie walsh and i differed on this all the time and she's like it shouldn't matter if you're four two you could still go out and win a gold medal i'm like no like that's what you're you're going to be unsuccessful in that um, not to say that you should, that you can't have that as your goal but uh so having a reality as well and trying to get them to be realistic with what they can accomplish um but still having goals that are maybe unrealistic uh because i think those drive you to maybe be better than you ever thought you could be um Goal, uh, what exactly did you want to talk about in terms of gold? Just anything, anything that comes to mind. Just, you know, um, the, the big thing for me is having won the gold medal. It's what you do with it. And that's why, that, that's why I really asked you to be a part of this project because winning a gold medal is one thing, but taking that gold medal and trying to inspire the next generation is all about inspired living to me, you know? And I love that you do that. I think there's a lot of, Olympic champions out there that take their gold and just put it on their wall and just say, I'm the champ and that's it. That was great. But the fact that you've taken that and you're, you're continuing to be a part of the game, you're continuing to, you know, grow the game through coaching. And, um, you know, to me that that's what it's all about. So I was just kind of curious if you could just talk a little bit about that experience of the joy of the fulfillment and taking that, and transferring it over to the next generation through coaching? Um, so I guess passing it on, you know, the, the goal, I guess in a lot of ways, winning the gold really helped me define how important the process is, which we talked about, um, of getting to, to whatever that is. Um, and then being able to apply that to different aspects of life, for myself and also, you know, talking about it for others. I think that's kind of probably for a lot of people, it um, really kind of, uh, I guess, either magnifies or um, really shows to them, hey, you, you, you stayed with this process. Um, you, you know, you had these coach, you had these goals, you, you did all this stuff uh, and you got to that pinnacle. And then you look back and you realize, wow, all those things I did do really did build up to that, that, that point. Uh, and then you're able to, well, if you want, I guess, cause like you said, not everyone does, um, be able to share that, um, with others. Uh, you know, I, I like to think, I like to think, I know I'm wrong. Um, but you would like to think that everyone in some way, shape or form would do something along those lines and not necessarily even, you know, in, in whatever they won the gold medal in, it could be, Hey, I won this. I recognize this process and now I'm in business or now I'm in, uh, a church or now I'm in, uh, whatever. Um, some, and now I'm applying that same process and this is the process I learned from this. And now I'm applying it to, to this, uh, because I do think it really, it, it shows, uh, whoever accomplished that, uh, that, yeah, this is, this is how you got there. You didn't just, you know, wave the magic wand or whatever to, to, to get there. It took a lot of, for most people, I should say, it took a lot of hard work, perseverance, um, pushing through a lot of you know, quote unquote blood, sweat and tears to get to that point. Uh, and then being able to share that with others. For me, most of the time, uh, it's more questions that are asked to me that I share with people on the, you know, on my team and whatnot. Well, what did you do? And, you know, okay, well, this is, this is how I set it up. Um, in, in a lot of ways, my team is set up in, you know, that kind of shape to, to go where we want to go. Not exactly. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of let, I, I don't, I don't advertise it a whole heck of a lot and I don't talk about it a whole heck of a lot. I don't 
throw the bling bling around a lot. Um, but if someone wants to talk about it and brings it up, then I'll definitely engage uh, and talk about what it means, how I, you know, how did you get there? Obviously, is a, a question you get all the time. Sure. Uh, and the reality is, is I'll, I'll share that with them and make sure they understand that, yeah, it wasn't just overnight. It was a, a, a process, literally a very, obviously a lifetime process, but really a three-year process. And uh, it's it recognized that that can apply to you as well. So when someone engages me, usually I engage back in that, but I'm not someone that usually is, I guess, out there pushing it. Todd, you've inspired me over the years, man, ever since the UCSB days and yeah. you recruiting me and, and yep. just watching you through the, through the years and just watching your process and talking about the journey, like your, your journey has inspired me. So I know that it's inspired many other people. So um, I just, I can't thank you enough, man. I really appreciate you being a part of this and, and opening up your mind and your heart into this project. And, um, I know we're going to, we're going to impact quite a, quite a bit of people, quite a few people. What piece of advice could you give the youth athlete right now that their sport just got taken away during this coronavirus time? Um, you know, it's, uh, I think the, the word that comes to mind is to persevere. Um, that, I look at this as more of a, okay, it's kind of like, what can you, it's kind of like a failure. Um, and it isn't really a failure. That's anything that anyone could have done per se, uh, any athlete. Uh, but what can you learn? What can you sure. learn from, from this in this time um, that things will get back, but you need to persevere and what can you take from it? And for, for my team, uh, for, I met with every single girl as soon as it happened we got canceled all that good stuff uh, or bad stuff I should say um, but every single one of them I told them look there's a silver lining to that th to this and that is you're getting another year in college which means that you now have the opportunity to potentially get a master's at maybe this university Cal Poly could be a totally different university um, but so take a look at the silver lining and whether you're a freshman or a senior let's start taking a you know that Go to start going down that road, uh, and if you never even thought about it, now is the time to start thinking about it because this is kind of a golden opportunity. And if, for example, you are at Poly, you're going to graduate, and then you still have a year left of eligibility, where could you go if it's not Poly that you can get your master's and maybe play, and that can get you into that university that maybe you wouldn't have gotten into that university, um, maybe it's whatever that is. Like so. To me, that was kind of persevere and look at, okay, what are the positives that can come out of it? For my team, that was the, the main focus was, look, here's a silver lining positive. Uh, let's, let's move forward each individual uh, and see where that can take them. Should I have one girl who redshirted last year, is getting this year back, literally is, came in with like 90 units. So came in as a junior. I'm like, you could practically get your PhD if you so desired, like, so there, there, small little silver linings there. Um, and, and you got to persevere to get to those because those will help you in the long run. And you said they should be learning, like what specifically should they be learning? Should they be doing their, you know, touches on the ball? Should they be watching video, listening to podcasts, anything like that? Anything specific? I would say all of the above as they are able to, um, because obviously okay. touching the ball, yeah, they can do little touches by themselves, but they can't, you know, some people don't have the ability to, or they don't have a pepper partner or, um, you know, they can hit a ball against a wall type of stuff, but there's only so many things you can do. Um, I'm big into mental imagery. And so, you know, go, go through ma matches in your head, just sit down and close your eyes and spend 10 minutes resting your eyes and go through it, literally go through a match in your head versus your partner. You're, you and I are playing, you know, Stein and Dane, and, uh, and what are we doing? What's our strategy? Okay, where, where are we serving? All right, right. and just cool. think it through. And try and kind of almost feel it. Awesome. All right, Todd, appreciate your time. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Aaron, thank you. Take care and keep me posted. Hey, thank you so much, Todd. All right, man. All right, bye. This episode is brought to you by DAF Global. If you're looking to start a podcast or you have a podcast and you're looking for editing services, hit up my guys Oliver and Garrett at DAF Global. 
They're awesome. They help me with this podcast and they take care of all kinds of different services like editing and audio enhancement. And they're great to work with. They're also offering a 10% discount to all within the game listeners. So hit my guys up at DAF Global on Instagram and also on their website, www.dafglobal.co.uk.